today we're going to talk about how to not end up with this. Like, none of us want to be the one who ends up with our data viz on WTF viz because we screwed up the analysis or because we just didn't know what was going on with our data and kind of let our results guide, our results kind of dominate all of our sanity checking. So what can actually go wrong with our data, right? Well, like we've all seen the XKCD example where we don't, we kind of forget that it's geographic data and if you do raw geographic data and don't normalize, you'll end up with geographic data. So, right, you need to understand if your data needs to be normalized, needs to be mean subtracted, there needs to be some kind of processing to it um, to get it to actually represent what you're trying to look for. Another thing that can happen often is you're missing data, right? If you're missing like half your data, then you, your algorithms are gonna break. Like then you might get great results, right? You, you know how you get the most fantastic correlations ever? You lose your entire data set. Because if you have a correlation of two points to two points, it's gonna be like 100, man. Um, and the other thing that can typically happen is, so this, this is the result we wanted. We really wanted to prove that forecasts do a great job of predicting climate. The only problem is, this was buggy code. Something was shifted, and this is completely artificial remnant of the code itself, and has nothing, great, and has nothing to do with whether the actual technique, whether our model really does a good job of predicting our results. Right? And so the question is, where should we start? Um, this was a GIF. Um, right, because we can be really flooded with lots of information and we just like buried under it and oftentimes it can be intimidating. You know, I'm given a new data set and I just don't know what to do. Yeah, our usual instinct is, let's just, you know, pipe it through some machine learning algorithm, get some great results. Don't do that. Um, start with research. Wikipedia is your friend. You want to know kind of where your data is from who produces it, what your data is, right? If you're looking at um, some new, like, if you're looking at crime rates, wiki crime rates, just see, like, what are the, and the reason you do this is because you want to know what are, like, the typical values, what are the typical patterns. There's nothing new under the sun. Even if your data is brand new, something similar probably exists. And what you want to do is, right, is get a feel for what's existing um, going on. Because about 99% of the time, that new surprising thing you found, it's not that you did something cool and found something awesome, it's that you screwed up. And we're trying to avoid the results due to screw up, right? So always research your data and get a, like, enough of a grounding for it so that when you're talking to other people, you can be like, I'm looking at, you know, crime rates in Madagascar, and the way we compute this is we find this, right? Um, you know, we got this data from this database and et cetera. Um, step two, Python is fantastic, right? We all like IPython notebook. And I don't know why nobody does this, but print your data, right? If we have one of these self-documenting data sets, right? A CSV now with pandas, we can get a lot of our column information, our row information. We can, like, know what's in our data before we plot with it. NetCDFs and HDFs are the most fantastic file formats because they try to be self-documenting. So... Right, we can load in our data and just start printing out the attributes, start printing out your column names. Again, so you start knowing what it is you're working with because say I didn't print this out, right, and I just plotted it. Well, what dimension would I have plotted? Step three is to actually plot the data. So this is just a plot, right? Now, what's wrong with this? Well, you guys can guess, right? There are no labels. So I label it grades and student ID. Here's a problem. Is this, da this data is actually independent, right? So it looks like a great pattern. Like, hey, the data is cyclical. But the X is independent of the Y, and so this is complete nonsense. So now we're going to actually rearrange our data. And so when we sort our data, it looks like your typical grading curve. Right? And so step two is, step one is just like throw up a plot, realize you screwed up, 
Step two is start rearranging your data because it's um, not dependent and you're going to end up realizing, oh, pattern, expected pattern. And here's the thing, right? If my pattern, if it didn't, didn't look like this, I would start getting worried because this is the typical distribution for grades. Like if I saw, like I see a weird dip in the 40s. So I'm like, okay, did I write somebody's grade in wrong or did I, or did something weird happen over there? And that's where you start the exploration. When you're getting into higher dimensional data, right? Like we were talking about, like here's temperature data. Just pull out one location, one location on Earth. It doesn't even matter what. What you're not looking for here is like grand global con conclusions. What you're looking for here is what does my data look like on a basic level? And so here I know my data, is, I learned my data is sinusoidal. And it should be. It's temperature data. Temperature is seasonal, it's sinusoidal. If I'm not reading in my data as sinusoidal from one place on Earth, again, it's just like my reader is wrong, my data is wrong, something went horribly, horribly wrong. And you want to catch and it might seem silly, but you want to catch all these things in the early stages, right? Because you don't want to be like presenting this big fancy visualization where that has some glaring error because you didn't catch little mistakes in the first place. And so right, step one, we'll plot our time series. Another thing we'll do is we'll plot our dimensional data. And what we learned here is the world is upside down. Here's what we really learned, right? When we're working with clim your typical climate data set, the world is upside down. They run it from the Antarctica down. And so you have to know this when you're doing analysis, if your analysis is at all dependent on where things are on Earth. Right? And so what we'll do now is we'll correct it so everything is even. But we want to have this knowledge of, so things are going on here. We want to have this knowledge that we learn that our world here starts in Africa. It's a zero to 360 grid. We learn that we're in a negative 90 to 190. You know, we see our typical pattern, you know, right, the equator is supposed to be pretty hot, the poles are supposed to be really cold. If none of this shows up, again, you screwed something up here. The other thing we're doing this is because what we want to see is back to our science series, the same kind of logic of, this is Antarctica. Antarctica is the opposite of us. They're hottest in January, they're coldest in our summer. If we're not seeing that seasonal pattern in our snapshot, we haven't aligned our grids correctly. Okay. So we'll do that. We also want a histogram. Histograms are your best friend. Here's why. What if I want to apply a shiny model to this? The data is not Gaussian. Half the models we use are Gaussian. Right? So if you haven't checked that your data is Gaussian before applying your model to it, there's no reliability that your results are correct. So you always want a histogram. Happens that this is a weird semi-bimodal distribution, which you'll find is typical in STEM courses. But you want a histogram. Um, also, always take the min, max, mean, median, right? I know they sound basic and you're all like, oh, she's, this is so boring, why is she talking about this? Because I keep working with people who they don't do these basic things, right? They don't know what the mins are on their data. They don't know the maxes, the means or the medians. And so they give you these like fancy things fed into logistic lasso Gaussian regression, you know, fancy machine learning soup. And you can't verify that the results are accurate because actually, no, then you go back to their data and their data is all broken. So those results, fantastic. Not great though. So, um, so why do we do this too? Two reasons. We always want to check the mean and the median because of outliers, right? Because medians are, means are more sensitive to outliers. So you, if your means and your medians are really different from each other, then you know you're going to have outliers and they're going to be screwing up, I think, like half the algorithms out there. You want your mins and your maxes, again, to get a feel for, like, what are my typical numbers? Like, what's going to kind of seem out of range? If I had somewhere in this globe a max that was above 310, I've just found that somewhere on Earth is abnormal, um, abnormally hot. And it could mean two things. It could mean that, like, hey, global warming, the Earth blew up, or it could mean a temperature sensor broke. But we want to be able to do this kind of basic, you know, what are, kind of what are my expected numbers here? What do my normal pictures look like for this? And this is all fun, 
but when would have to like we'll have too much data and what, like we will almost be fighting with it because we'll have these basic right so all that stuff is basic but I haven't gotten to this data is multivariate right I've just given you one day one month I've given you one day one month I've given you these tiny snapshots of time but I haven't helped you characterize what all the data looks like and that's important too right because you're not just looking at this single you know this is like a start of the picture, but it doesn't, the problem with this is it doesn't tell you where in the data it's broken. It doesn't tell you that somewhere along the way the data is broken. This just tells you, or it might tell you like something's broken, but it won't tell you where or how, and that's the next step, right? We want to be able to detect what broke where and how. And so we'll start looking at multivariate relationships. Um, here, this is flood data, and we're looking at the relationship between all of these waves and groundwater, like we're looking at how all of these are pairwise compared to each other. Um, it's a scatter matrix, because what we're gonna do is, this is again, we wanna end up feeding this into a model. But before we feed this into a model that is based on the idea that these things are related to each other, we wanna say, hey, is there any chance in hell these are actually related to each other, right? So we'll feed in, so first we actually explore our variables. We see, hey, is anything related to each other? And it looks like no. But if we look at down at our flood, what we learned is, hey, these are bimodal. Not, they're like completely, like there's a one, there's a zero, and that's it. So, hey, that's a class. So, let's take our data again, let's recolor it, so we now have class-based stuff. All, and guess what, all of our floods kind of cluster in one region. Now that we've seen that we've, you know, in a basic just scatter plot, but we've colored it so that we can highlight our classes, we see, okay, there is evidence we might be able to do a classifier and might be effective because we see flood data, it's in one scatter typical region, everything else is kind of there to and around. Um, the other thing we want to do though is like write higher order stuff. So clustering algorithms are a friend. Um, and here you're not doing using clustering algorithms to find like what are typical patterns? You're looking at clustering patterns to confirm known phenomena, like in this case, biomes. This is precipitation data. And what we did is we just clustered the time series of precipitation data and we colored it. And we found biomes. And biomes are just typical geographic regions that fit into one. There are typical geographic regions there that have one kind of temperature pattern or climate, microclimate major climate actually pattern. And so our deserts are all kind of together, um, which means our data doesn't do anything weird with deserts, it mountainous regions, um, pretty dry. And so we'll confirm this by actually then looking at the cluster means. When we look at our cluster means, yeah, deserts pretty dry. Um, we have a lot of rain in the, our highest rainfall is that bright yellow color, which is like Indonesia and the top of South America. So we'd want to go now back to Wikipedia and confirm, hey, is that, is that where we kind of usually see the largest rainwater? Because basically, you might find something cool and interesting and new, but to do that, you need to be able to reliably tell people that I read my data incorrectly, I know what my data is doing, right? Um, the other thing we're going to, so this is one way to look for known patterns. Another one is um, look for structure. And this is where the PCA and the LDA and come in, right, your dimension reduction algorithms. Um, and so typical, right, we'll look at, we'll apply it, in this case, to a seasonal data set, because again, we expect we'll break out to seasons. This isn't so useful though, right? Because you see a lot of dots. We see groupings, and we expect groupings, because seasons. So then we'll color it by month and seasons. Um, which I guess is the other sub thing of this talk, right? We know about seasons, so we can use them to color our data to help us see that the patterns we expect are there. Um, always use outside knowledge. If you expect your data to be grouped in a certain way, you know, build that into the coloring or the classifying or the PCA or whatever technique you're using to kind of do your preliminary structural integrity checks. Like if this data, you know, and so what I learned here is, hey, there's a weird little outlier, and that might be fun to explore further. Um, and we'll use some, we can use some later fit, so to signal fi filtering or whatever to try to find out what's going on with those outliers. But otherwise, we want to see this consistent patterning going on. Um, 
And then you can, you know, control your own data. Okay. That was absurdly short, wasn't it? Questions? Yeah. Ah, oh, God. My favorite was when they were doing like a logistic regression on model data against the thing being fed into the model. So, yeah, and by the way, this happens all the time. I mean, granted, I'm kind of doing that with one of my projects. Um, that's actually what you found with, oh, actually, that's the broken picture I just threw up here. Um, Um, sorry. Oh, I get what you mean. Um, actually, both of these. This one was fun because the guy we were working with was, how do I do a full screen? Ah. So this one um, was the one getting great correlations on like inundation and DVI because you're missing most of the data. And if you're missing half your data, your correlations start looking great a lot of the time. Um, and it's almost like probability. Um, this one is actually an example of that. Um, forecast, climatology is used to put in forecast models. Like the linked, climatology is fed into forecast, and the observations are fed into forecast two months back. So I shifted my forecast two months back. So if you try to do, hey, how good is a two months back forecast that's based on two months back data and predicting two months back data, yeah, you'll get great results, um, but not terribly interesting. Um, those are some of my, um, and then I remember actually the first time I ever looked at an STDF file, I printed out everything all zeros and I was like, hey, something broke. I didn't know I understand that CDF. Um, and it was like one of those where the data is packed with a format with an add factor and a scale factor. And, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. One of the ones I love, and we don't have it, I didn't, couldn't find the figure for it, but we did um, the GPCP, one of these precipitation models, and we did, we do the clustering on both dimensions. Once we cluster it over space, and we'll make, so we'll do it over time in our space, but this is like if we cluster it over time, and then we'll plot the clusters. And the other way we'll do it is we'll cluster it over space, so that each observation in time is a, so each observation in time is an observation, is a cluster, and then we plotted that, like the occurrence of clustering, like how it fits into the cluster. Um, like here's cluster one, cluster one, cluster two, you know, the time series of which observation is in which cluster. And doing that, we found that one of our clusters was completely out. And so then we looked at it, and it was, that was the day the they changed over satellites. So a lot of times, like, Clustering can help if you do it. You if you do it kind of multi. If you do clustering along multiple dimensions and like just visualize all your feature vectors, um, you can often. That's often a way to kind of help with the high D problem because you can now inspect it from multiple ways. Um, and again, that whole like an outline cluster can usually help you detect did something go wrong or is something cool happening. Yeah. yeah, like, I mean, this is 2D. I can make this 3D trivially, right? But have, what I find, right, is, like, once you get to 3D, you have to rotate it to see anything. And once you get past, and this is kind of, like, right, 3D, semi-4D, because the colors are giving you seasonal information. But, like, once you get further than that, like, most people just can't understand the visualization. So it's like, I can give you the fanciest heat map tree linked brush 
you know, does stuff. But if like it's not going to go into your head, you're not going to see the problem anyways. Yeah. No, I mean, yes and no. Like in pandas, you can use the cross-validation techniques if you're doing the models. Um, if you're not doing pandas, like I just had to write my own linear regression and then sanity check it. So a lot of that is like going back to, okay, this is how linear regression works. These are what the coefficients are going to come out. I'm going to feed in my fake data. I'm going to get out my fake results. Um, so you have to unit test your own code, which I know nobody does. Um, oh. Technically, technically. I mean, one of my favorite stories of this is like the GPCP data, which is one of these like big metadata e science data, right? Subdocumenting type. I mean, I know I said to print them out, but this guy says a great story. Like, this stuff is supposed to be, supposed to be able to just pull the values right from the data, put it up, whatever. They were filling in random values. So, like, none of the metadata actually matched the data. Um, and stuff like that happens all the time. Um, and then there's also like that weird, like it's known in the community that the data is broken in just this special way. La, uh, you know, talk to people and it's like, oh, our instruments are a little bit broken. You know, so you can't, so, and they use this ground truth to validate the assimilated data, which is a little bit biased in this way, which is used to, yeah. Like every community kind of has their own special sauce and part of it is you just have to know it, which is part of that whole, again, researching your data because you'll find a lot that, there's stuff in how the data is aggregated, and you'll be like, oh, I found something cool and new, or I found something broken, and they're like, ah, we knew about it here. You just do this, apply this formula here, and it'll all work out. Which is really the heat map problem, right? Because everybody who, if I can find, right, because everybody who works with geographic data long enough knows that, hey, you have to normalize. And everybody who's a newbie to geographic data is like, I'm going to make a shiny D3 visualization of Twitter data. So it's um, so a lot. So that goes back to you know, like look at what other people have done and what kind of analysis they've done to their data. Because a lot of these pre-processing things are pretty like common along every but along communities. Um, other questions? <laughs> 